Hello and welcome to FACTS webinar, Selling Direct-to-Consumer Whole and Half Postured Hogs. Our guest presenter is Dana Burtness with Nettle Valley Farm in Minnesota. I'm Samantha Gasson, FACTS Humane Farming Program Associate, so, associate, associate, and I will be moderating this session. Thank you all for joining us. A few introductions before we dive right in. Um, Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization headquartered in Illinois. We work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, promoting policies that make foods from animals safe and healthy to eat, and helping consumers make informed food choices. My colleague Larissa and I run FACT's Humane Farming Program, which works with livestock and poultry farmers across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, training courses, mentorship, and of course, wonderful webinars with wonderful presenters. So you can visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about our farmer services. At this time, I am seriously delighted <laughs> to introduce our esteemed presenter, Dana Burtness. Dana runs Nettle Valley Farm in Spring Grove, Minnesota, with assistance from her husband, Nick Wynn. Dana finishes about 75 to 85 pigs each year on a diverse pollinator orient oriented, oriented yes, annual and perennial pastures using a barn and pasture hybrid model. Whole and half hogs are sold directly to farmers within about 150 miles of the farm. Nettle Valley Farm is also home to an incubator farm program, postured egg layers, and as of 2022, seasonal brush goats. I, I'm, I'm actually really excited about this webinar. Dana, how, how many years has this been in the works? Maybe a couple of years. I first met Dana in our mentorship program. She was a mentee, and I knew I'm a, I, I love your model, and I cannot wait to hear more about it. At uh, this point, I am very happy to turn the virtual mic over to Dana. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. All right, here we go. Just like we practiced. <laughs> uh, how's that looking? Brilliant. Perfect. Nailed it. Okay. <laughs> You did that. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Sam. Thank you much, so much, Larissa. Thank you, Fact. Um, this is, I'm very excited to be here because I'm a dork and I love talking about all things farming food and especially uh, pork and, and pigs. So um, yeah, let's get into it. Welcome everybody. Um, it's been really fun to read all of your uh, farm names because I swear I follow at least like half of you on Instagram. So um, it's good to be here and thanks for tuning in. So yeah, we're going to talk about selling whole and half hogs. So there's me and my husband, Nick. We don't always dress like that and we don't always dress like that for pickups, but um, we do have a um, uh, the very last pickup of the year, we always wear our um, buffalo plaid onesies for our customers, just because I don't know why not. It's fun. Uh, let's see. It's down. Okay, so I would love to know. Um, just quick, type in the chat. How are you currently marketing your hogs? And I think that's going to be more for just sharing with each other. So I hope I hope folks can make other connections and um, connect with other people and um, share share a lot of like lateral um, connections too. Um, yeah. So while you're typing that, I'm going to take a look at that later. But um, so a little bit about us. So that's me on the left there. Um, that's my husband Nick. Um, we have been farming, I've been farming on and off since I was 19, used to be a vegetable farmer, switched to livestock. Um, this will be our ninth year of uh, finishing hogs on pasture. So our whole deal is that we sell whole and half hogs every fall. So we're seasonal only. So we only finish um, in the fall and we sell direct to families within two and a half hours of our farm. And yeah, Nettle Valley Farm. Um, we used to sell some to restaurants as holes and halves, but COVID killed a hundred percent of our restaurant sales, which stunk and they never really came back. Um, yeah, so there, that's where we are. We're in Southeastern Minnesota. We're in the beautiful driftless area. If any of, if any of you have been there, it's really nice. Uh, that's generally where we are. This is our very weird land. Just wanted to give you guys a context of what we're working with. Originally, um, we bought the 67 acres that has the really weird outline, thinking that we'd finish pigs in the woods because we have a lot of oaks. 
as we scaled up, we realized that um, for a lot of reasons, that's not a good fit for us. That's a different presentation though. Um, and then we have a little homestead and then we rent some land that we finish the pigs on. I did want to include a couple of very shameless plugs. So thanks for Sam and thanks to Sam and Lister for letting this sneak in there. Um, for 2024, we're pretty much full for this year, but we do have apprentices via the Savannah Institute. And um, we also run an incubator farm program on our farm if you're interested in um, getting one to three years of experience running a business before actually buying your own or leasing your own farm. All that info um, is on our website, nettlevalleyfarm.com. Um, yeah, so a little bit of our pig specific story really quickly. Um, in 2015, 2016, we started off with three large blacks sort of on a whim. Um, we knew we wanted to get into finishing hogs and we knew, or we knew it wanted to get into livestock pasture livestock and finishing hogs was at the very top of the list. So we, on a whim, tried it over a winter and just immediately fell in love with pigs. And um, so that's that following summer, 2016, we started with 10 pigs on pasture. Those are Burke mule foot mixes. Um, the next year we did sort of a Heinz 57, her, uh, scaled up to Heinz 57 heritage breed cross. So 25, 40 in the next year, 50 in the next year, and then COVID hit. And so we actually were only going to do 60 in 2020, but um, due to skyrocketing demand, um, we scaled up to 73 and then 75. Last year, we finished about 80. And then this year, we're going to be up to about 85. And there are Hamp, Duroc, Old Spot crosses. Um, there's some York genetics in there too. Um, this is just, we're not going to talk about uh, the Wagon Wheel Hub today, but this is sort of an aerial shot. Um, you can see the Wagon Wheel Hub back in the background, and um, we use electric netting from Premier One to make paddocks off of that. Um, another fun thing we do is we have a partnership with a local organic farm, so we um, finish the pigs on a pea and barley so that's corn and soy and fish meal free feed that's also certified organic, as well as thousands of pounds of produce from an organic farm. So what we're going to cover today, um, we are going to talk about the pros and cons of selling whole and half hogs. Um, we're going to talk about our Nettle Valley process that we have come to over the past eight or nine years. Um, so that's reservations, deposits, payments, cut sheets, feedback, all of the above. Um, we're also going to talk about pricing a little bit. And as Sam mentioned, let's just save questions for the end. Um, but yeah, I've got plenty of time, so no rush for questions. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about this very early on um, because uh, Sam and Larissa sent me a list of hundreds of questions that you guys submitted beforehand. Thank you. So I do want to let you know that we are not going to cover some of the stuff that you guys asked about. So if... Uh, if this, if this webinar no longer applies to you, then you can feel free to get to chores or whatever, but we're not gonna talk about production methods. So our wagon wheel hub, forages, um, infrastructure, we're not gonna talk about that today. We're also not gonna talk about breeds. Um, we're not going, this might disappoint some of you, we're not gonna talk about on-farm slaughter and processing. Um, and we're not, we're also not gonna talk about different levels of processing because all of that is extremely state and sometimes even county uh, dependent. Um, and trying to cover all 50 states and beyond is just, we don't have time for that. Um, so I'll tell you what we do and what we've learned about Minnesota. Um, but I would say just a blanket piece of advice is just ask state people in your state what those rules are. We're also not going to talk about flat fee sales. So like say, a half hog is is 500 bucks and a whole hog is a thousand bucks all included. Um, that definitely can work. And um, some people love that. I just don't have any personal experience with it. We're also not going to talk about shipping meat. Um, again, that totally can work. I don't know of many people who ship whole and half hogs, but I'm sure they're out there. Maybe if you do that, name them in the name yourself or others in the comments. Again, I just don't have any personal experience with it. And I think what I want to share is that there is no foolproof formula for any of this stuff, right? So our farms are all different. Our contexts are all different. Our personal goals are all different. Our scales are drastically different. 
Um, so what I'd invite you to do for the next hour is just think of this as one case study. So this is just how Nettle Valley Farm makes this holes and halves work for our context. So we have very specific quality of life goals. Um, we have a weird landscape <laughs> that we're working with. Um, we have different finances from you, personal preferences. We have different availability as far as different levels of processing, all of that stuff. So think of this as just some suggestions for, uh, a, for, your, to, for you to tailor for your specific context. Okay, so let's get into it. Holes and halves. Um, so I personally love selling holes and halves. Um, we really haven't done a lot of selling cuts or even bundles, honestly, because holes and halves have worked so well for us. And we've been doing this um, since the beginning. So since we started with those three pigs over that winter in 2015. Um, I, When I was a vegetable farmer, I sold wholesale, but I also did do some time at... Um, at farmers markets, and so just a, a little bit of uh, when I when I switch switch from veggie farming to livestock farming, a little bit of of sort of that hesitancy to sit at farmers markets for long hours, long days, um, sometimes for very low sales, um, sort of stuck with me. So right from the get go, I really wanted to just do um, pulls and halves. So pros. This method is really great for beginners. I mean, because I'm, I'm hoping that you'll start if you're getting into pasture dogs, you'll start with, you know, three to six or up to 10 uh, hogs finishing on pasture. And so it's pretty easy to find up to 20 people to, to buy those halves and holes. Oh, so much less labor when you're selling holes and halves as opposed to sitting at a farmer's market for, um, not to mention, well, for half a day, and then not to mention all the time it takes to get loaded up in the morning, um, drive to the farmer's market, sit at the farmer's market, drive home, unload. Um, that's a lot of work. And I really do hope that you're all, to the extent that you can, accounting for your own time. Um, also, you're selling the whole animal. Like, as we know, as we all know, everybody wants bacon and everybody wants chops. But depending on where you are in the country, it can be harder to sell the hawks or it can be harder to sell the bones or the lard, lard especially. Um, and when you're selling a whole or a half, that's just, that's taken care of for you. Along with that, there's no inventory management. You're not constantly organizing and reorganizing and keeping track of everything that's in your freezers. Um, also, there are, there you can do this, you can do whole and half animal sales without any on-farm freezer storage. And oftentimes, depending on your state, if you do want to have that on-farm freezer storage, you're going to have to get permits for that and get inspected, um, de again, depending on your state. So you can skip all that. Um, we've done all of this without needing to do barn to door, graze cart, any of those. And those are great services. Um, but for us, well, the they can be pretty expensive. And sometimes the value proposition is totally there for a certain farm and then sometimes it's not. Um, so yeah, we've been able to just skip all of that. Um, check with your state. I'm gonna say this over and over again. Um, check with your state about all these rules, check with your county. Um, but oftentimes just selling a whole and half animal means a lot more flexibility with the type of processing that you can access. Um, of course, there are pros, there are cons. So potentially you could have lower overall sales because when you're buying and when you're selling in bulk, um, you know, you're, you have one flat price per pound of hanging weight, or maybe you're going to do a flat rate for a whole or a half. You know, when we go to the grocery store, obviously we can see that there's a different price between a pork tenderloin and a pound of ground pork. And so Maybe if you can sell all your pork, maybe you're leaving some money on the table by not selling retail. However, I would argue that even if your overall sales are lower, you might be more profitable, um, especially when you're looking at labor. Um, there definitely needs to be more customer support and education and handholding and um, facilitation when you're selling holes and halves. Maybe 50 years ago, I bet there wouldn't be because old. I'm finding that older generations have a lot more experience like maybe they're 
mom or grandma or, or grandpa bought freezer freezer beef or freezer pork and they just know the cuts whereas my generation certainly me before I started uh raising pigs I didn't know what all the cuts were and I found the whole process to be a little bit intimidating but luckily there's a lot of resources out there and also you yourself are a great resource for your customer um yeah along those lines potentially there's some potentially confusing details like what is a hanging weight like if you're just a normal, regular, regular person, like you're not going to know the difference between live weight, hanging weight, and then packaged weight and explaining all of those things and making sure people feel comfortable with those uh, details is important. And um, it can't, selling holes and halves can be much tougher for cash flow. Um, so for us, we're, we're, our cash flow is more like a, a grain farmer or a corn farmer just because you know we're spending all this money on pigs and feed and um, labor and everything. And then we don't start getting um, bigger amounts of money in until the fall. And so that's kind of tough and you have to have a, a pretty good um, banker for that sort of setup. Um, and But deposits do help and we'll talk about that. Okay, so when we first got it, got started with these 10 um, pastured hogs, well, we, we sold the first three hogs as holes and halves too, but it was, it was friends and family. Um, so first we would take, we would put it out there on email and social media, like, hey, we've got these, we're going to have these hogs, send us an email, let me know. Uh, I don't believe we took deposits at that point. And then once we found homes for all the pigs as holes and halves, we would share updates throughout the season. Um, then when it came time for the pigs to have their one bad day, we'd load all 10 pigs up on the trailer and drop them off at the processor. And that's generally, that was the end of our, excuse me, end of our involvement. And then from there on out, um, you tell your customer, okay, you've got to call the processor and you let them know what they're cutting, your cutting info is, your cutting instructions. And then when the meat is processed and done, the processor calls the customer then the customer pays us. Um, and that was an important part to, we, the customer would pay us. We would let the processor know, hey, you can release that meat. And um, then our processor would uh, coordinate a pickup with the customer and then the customer would pay the processing fee. So this totally works, um, especially on a very small scale. And it's, it's very bare bones. It's it's uh, pretty approachable. Um, I will say we have stopped doing most of this because the, the potential for error is so high. And I would imagine that most of us are getting into this because, or are doing this because we want to sell super, super high quality pork, the best of the best. Um, and we want to, and we care about our customers. Well, I'll just speak for myself. I really care about my customers and I care about the experience that they're having. And so it's rough. It was rough when, you know, the customers pay this really um, uh, appropriate, but higher than grocery store prices um, fee for our pork. And then they, they pick up their pork and they realize like, wait, this isn't what I ordered or um, wait, I wanted a fresh ham. I didn't want ham steaks. And then the whole experience can leave a bad taste in their mouth, even though it's not the farmer's fault. And I'm not blaming the processors either. Like, as we all know, there are major processing bottlenecks all over the country. We need more meat processors, um, small and very small meat processors who serve the local community. They are incredibly busy. Um, and so there's just human error involved in every step of the way. So now um, what we've developed over the years is instead of doing that, what we do is, here's an overview of our process, we'll get into each of these steps, but we uh, take reservations and then um, ask for deposits via JOT forms. That's a service that we use a lot. Then same thing, we still use Instagram and Substack um, and some other, and Facebook to, to share updates. We do a lot of um, pics and videos and our customers love that. And then come fall in September, we take in cut sheet um, instructions. So meat cutting instructions via jot forms. And then um, the second that we get the hanging weight from the, the processor, 
Um, we, and then, oh, the hanging weight and the processing total, we invoice them via WAVE, which we love um, instead of QuickBooks, WAVE is, is free unless you wanna accept payments through them. And then also we handle the pickups and the deliveries. So our customers never interact with our processor, which is better for the processor and it's better for the customers. Um, and we'll talk about each way that that sort of works throughout the process. Um, and then after the after everyone has gotten their pork and gets to start trying it, um, we solicit feedback via another job form. So let's get into each of those steps. So jot forms, I, I really love jot forms. It's not cheap. The plan that we use is $288 a year. And, um, but for us at 85 hogs and about 120 to 140 customers a year, it pencils out to, you know, a couple bucks a customer. And for how much this saves us as far as like time and headache, it's well worth every dollar. Um, so like I said, in the past, um, we would just accept an email and then track that. But um, now when we're using Jot Forms, we are able to collect all sorts of information and also sort of screen people and protect ourselves. So a big thing that will happen um, is, so you gotta have a good website with lots of information. You can see everything that we put out there, nettlevalleyfarm.com. And so when folks go and they're like, okay, I'm gonna reserve a pig, I'm ready. We do ask that they, um, we do ask them here to say, okay, review the FAQs and then also tell us by clicking, yes, you betcha, we have read all the details. Um, because in the past when we haven't done this, folks would confuse the deposit with the entire price of the hog, just because you get it, we're all busy. We don't necessarily read the details all the time. Um, and, and so I get it, but then it does, it's a rude awakening for a customer at the end when they're like, whoa, 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 I thought my whole hog was $300, not $1,600 or, or whatever the hanging weight ends up and the processing ends up being. So I would highly recommend that um, in your cut sheet or, or sorry, in your um, reservation form, you just have a check mark like this so that when something does happen um, at the end, something is gets confused. Obviously, be compassionate, be empathetic, but also this hopefully covers covers you a little bit. Um, but also, people people are gonna people, and we love them for it. But um, there will always be some surprises. Slide. Another thing that we love um, with Jot Forms instead of just an email sent in. Oh, and I was gonna also say for this step of the process, you can totally use free Google Forms. Um, it's a little bit clunky, but it's free. So that's great. Um, I would always encourage you anytime you're taking reservations for your farm, think about how you can be helping the other farms in your network um, and your neighbors. So whenever we take a reservation for a whole and half hog, we ask them, what else do you want? Um, do you want grass-fed lamb? Cool. I don't, I don't raise sheep, but my friend Heidi does, my friend Marin does. Um, do you want uh, veggies and flowers through a CSA? Great, I can connect you with somebody who does that. Um, and that's been a really fun way to not only support our friends and neighbors, but also we have a lot of farmer customers um, and it's nice to have that reciprocity. So I would encourage you to, uh, to always have this. And then what we do is we ask, say, Heidi with the sheep, we ask Heidi, hey, could you write up an email about what your offerings are? We then take that and send it to our customers, not the other way around, just because customers don't always want their information shared. But then it's the ball's in their court to do with it what they would like. Um, let's see. And then we leave a spot for them to also uh, follow up with us or um, ask any questions and we'll follow up with them. Um, I'm skipping some stuff here, but it also, we just ask the basics. Do you want a whole hog or a half hog? Do you want um, home delivery or do you want to pick it up? That sort of thing. But these are the, the more unique parts of our, our form. And then we always ask, how did you hear about us? Because it's amazing. Um, how many people, how you can identify, use this question to identify like who your superstar customers are, who your champions are. Also, we noticed um, that more and more people were finding us through Instagram um, and fewer people through Facebook. 
um, that's changed a little bit, but it's like, okay, that helps us um, know where to focus. So that's a great thing to also include. Okay, and this is where um, Zapier comes in and, or is it Zapier? I don't know, I think maybe it's Zapier. If you know, maybe type that in the, in the comment uh, or in the chat. Um, so again, for about two bucks per customer per year or about $240 annually, um, anytime we get a re reservation via Jot Forms, it automatically puts a draft with all the details in my Gmail draft folder. So then I can open that up and um, edit it a little bit because I know a lot of our customers at this point, so I always like to add a note. Um, and then that sends them all the information they need to make a deposit. And the deposit is what actually formalizes and finalizes their reservation. Um, you can use Zapier for all sorts of stuff. It also makes um, an entry in Wave, our accounting system. So that saves me time. Um, it puts their contact in my phone. So if I'm out doing deliveries and I'm like, oh crap, I can't remember where um, the Johnsons are. I can pull that up really, really quickly. And that's, we're just barely scratching the surface um, at this point, but it, we really love this service. Um, yeah, it saves me hours and hours. So I don't have to write up the, the email every time. And uh, deposits, I would highly, highly recommend taking deposits. Um, deposits are great for your cash flow. So we ask for $150 for a half and then $300 for holes. Um, we open reservations in January and we take them, you know, all the way up till when we sell out, which can be anywhere from April through October. Um, yeah, it's great for cash flow. It gets, it makes sure that they're committed and um, you just have far fewer people flaking on you. Um, as far as the refundability of it, um, you just wanna be reasonable and compassionate. So like, obviously, if somebody gets a state, an out of state job, we're gonna refund them their deposit and sell it and, and sell that pig. Oftentimes they know people who might want to take that reservation for them. And sometimes I even, if it's somebody that I have a good relationship with, I ask them for that favor. Um, if it is the kind of thing where even after all these steps, you take a deposit and someone at the end of the year gets the invoice for the whole hog plus processing and they're like, wait, 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 I thought it was $300 for a whole hog, including processing. What my strategy is usually is to say like, oof, though, okay, um, first of all, like, it's not that, can you help me? Can you help me understand where we went wrong on my on my communication with you so I can fix it? And then also like, okay, well, I'll, um, uh, if you can just help me figure out who else to, to sell this pig to, that would be great. And I mean, at the end of the day, you don't wanna, you don't wanna burn people, but um, that's just up to your judgment. And then we like to send everybody a thank you card, a thank you postcard, um, that's our old logo. And I'm just burning through them until we get new ones printed. Um, but yeah, it's just nice to, send them a little thank you note and um, people feel appreciated and it's just a nice thing to do. And then we're pretty much all set till fall. Um, in the meantime, we like to try to post once a day on Instagram and Facebook about just what's going on on the farm. Uh, a new thing that I've added is a sub stack. Um, so just essentially a newsletter blog type of deal, but that's been really fun. We have about five to 600 people subscribed um, to that. And I'm just interested to see where Substack goes as sort of a service. And that's, this, this part is really, really key. Um, this is the whole reason why people are oftentimes willing to spend, a, 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 give you a premium on your pork is because they're seeing how you're caring for your pigs and they're seeing the beautiful pastures. And, um, it just makes them feel good. You know, people in marketing always talk about like, what's the problem you're solving for your customer. And honestly, I think a lot of times it's that people feel guilty about eating meat. And honestly, if you look at how most meat is raised in this country, it's not such a mis, mis, uh, misleading thing. <laughs> it's, it's, or, uh, the, it's, I feel like it's fair to feel kind of guilty about a lot of, um, the way, or a lot of the meat that we eat in this country. But so I think, um, providing a lot of transparency to your customers is solving a problem for them so they can feel really good about what they're eating. 
And then September rolls around um, and then it's customer um, education and cut sheet time. So luckily, so this can be the hardest part, but also there's a ton of resources out there. So if it's someone who has been buying whole and half animals forever, they're probably good to go. They can just fill out your cut sheet, um, show that in a second. But um, if, if it's someone else, figure out how they like to learn. Are they a visual learner? Do they just wanna hop on the phone with you? Um, whatever makes it uh, easy for them. And at this point is also when we start scheduling when people are gonna pick up their pork or when it's gonna get delivered. So I wanted to give a shout out to the Good Meat Project. They're doing all sorts of customer education um, about whole animal buying. There's also, ex almost every state's extension has some sort of guide to bulk meat buying. The only problem with these is that oftentimes those numbers are wrong. Like, do you see half a hog with a live weight of 250 to 270? Well, we get our pigs to like 300, 310. So a lot of times these are, are wrong. So it's, you just have to either edit them or let people know that it's just a, just a guideline. Another great way to um, treat your customers and then also uh, uh, educate them about the different cuts is to have in-person meat cutting demos. So we've got one coming up in April and another one coming up in July where our customers are just going to get together and we're going to break down a half hog and socialize. And then firsthand, they're going to learn about why can't I get roasts and or loin roasts and pork chops? You know, it, I think it'll help them understand that like, okay, those come from the same part of the pig. And I, I hope that'll be really helpful. Um, also, I couldn't help myself with this picture of this pig phone. Just hop on the phone with them. I have a, plenty of customers who the way they learn and the way they communicate is they just want to talk to me for 10 minutes. And I fill, I literally sit there and fill out the cut sheet with them while I'm on the phone with them and just ask them like, okay, would you rather have chops or roasts? Would you have, a, do you want extra ground pork or do you want a ham? You know, it's, that's just some, that's the way that some people learn best. Um, YouTube is your friend. Um, you can send all these free YouTube videos to your customers to help them understand. And then we, so then we get to the cut sheet. So we think of our cut sheet as an educational tool as well. Um, so it's again, the, the, cut, the cut sheet is on Jot Forms. I highly, highly, highly recommend doing a cut sheet because um, when we first got started, the way that customers would submit their order was they would just call up the, the processor who probably has somebody working there who's way stressed, way overworked, is wearing like five different hats. And um, we were finding oftentimes their first question um, is like, okay, how thick do you want your chops? And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What if I don't want chops? What if I want loin roasts? Um, and we just found that our customers were getting overwhelmed. It wasn't a good experience for them. And we just wanted a, a way to sort of slow, slow that down, something where they can just peruse it on their own time um, and not have to be in that, stressed out in that moment of, of answering these questions with someone who is way overworked. <laughs> um, so we, uh, with the help of my dad, created this online cut sheet and it's working really well. So again, this is Jot Forms. Um, so we have a little greeting. We let people know, hey, I'm here for questions. Um, just give me a call if you want help filling this out. And it takes, we organize the cut sheet by primal. And so it takes you through the various primals and it talks about all your different options. And then we have it can set up conditionally. So if you select, um, okay, I want a fresh ham, then it doesn't also ask you about what kind of cure you want on your ham because that wouldn't make any sense. So this is just an example of the, the card, Jotforms calls it for the loin. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's nice for people to just look at this at their, at their leisure. Walks it through. So this is just a before and after. So this is what we used to do, um, or, or sort of the intermediate. So when we found out that okay, oof, people are not having a good experience calling their order in, we said, okay, call us, and then we will translate it into this very confusing half sheet by hand, and then we'll take a picture of it, scan it in, and then we will email it to the processor. Um, 
So this is our, our what we use now is where Jot Forms really, really shines. So it takes that all the information from the customer's cut sheet and it translates it into this beautiful PDF where I don't have to do anything manually. Then you just send that into the processor. Um, if your processor is really old school and they don't do email, you might have to print this out and hand it to them. Um, but also I would say now is the time if you're thinking about making any of these changes, uh, get a meeting with your processor, um, bring them a pie or a six pack, <laughs> make sure you tell them you appreciate them. And then also say like, look, I think I'm going to tweak. I, I'd like to tweak my system a little bit. Is this the, the kind of thing that um, you'd be up for partnering with me on? Because your cut sheet is not going to look exactly like mine. This is something that we developed with um, our processor, Burt's, Burt's Meets in Yoda. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so then payment and delivery. So the second I get, I have both their hanging weight price and their processing, I invoice all of the customers via Wave, which is great. Um, and then at that point, um, we also actually, actually our customers, so folks who want home delivery within two and a half hours of us pay $75, a flat fee for home delivery. And they actually pay that with their deposit at the beginning of the season. So obviously your total at the end of the season is gonna reflect the deposit and the and the delivery fee. Um, home delivery, we, well, we have seven slaughter dates leading up to Thanksgiving. Um, we schedule all of our home deliveries at the beginning of the that seven week window, just because weather here in Minnesota can be iffy. Um, and then as far, once those are all done, then we switch to doing pickups. So what we do is last year, what we did was on Wednesday, we would head up, um, pick up all the holes and halves that have already been paid for. And so they belong to that customer. Um, we pick them up, pack them. Um, we pack them into these, you can see there that blue tote bag. Then we pack that inside of an insulated um foil pack and then we pack that into a wax box and then we pack that into an insulated cooler so we transfer all of our meat from the processor to a, uh, a freezer a rented freezer space we rent three to six pallets of, of space each fall for just a couple of months and then um, folks come directly to that freezer space to pick up from us um, or in, in another case um, we will take, so it'll be Rochester pickups in the morning. And then once everyone's picked up in the morning, we re, we go back into the freezer. Um, and this is all happening on Saturday. So the pork has been there for a few days in the negative 20 degree freezer. So we do Rochester pickups in the morning straight out of that freezer. Then that afternoon, we um, pick all the orders, all the holes and halves from the freezer and load them into that insulated trailer again. And then we drive them to our farm and that's where people um, pick up from there as well. So nobody is picking up, nobody is calling the processor. No one is submitting a cut sheet to the processor. Um, we are picking up all of the meat at one time, which is a godsend to the processors um, in their opinion, just because if you have uh, people, you know, if you have 20 customers who are buying half hogs and you've dropped off 10 hogs, that's 20 more um, customers that they have to coordinate with. They have to answer 20 more phone calls. They got to take 20 more, um, do 20 more, um, uh, bring up 20 more customers. It's just a ton of work for them. And all those places are where people can make mistakes. Also, we like to pick up our pork we, um, because we print out their the customer's cut sheet and use that as a checkoff. Um, mistakes in the pork processing is it gets better and better every year. So fewer and fewer mistakes, but still mistakes do happen. Um, so it's just nice to know that if there is something missing or something that was a little different, that we can warn the customer about that or we can make it right. Um, I like to know that uh, ahead of time because in the past, if if the customer goes to, to the processor, picks up their meat, they get it home and say, wait a minute, I don't have my spare ribs and all of my pork, my ground pork is plain when I wanted Italian sausage. It's like, well, if you called the processor, I have no paper trail there. I don't know where the error happened. Um, 
I don't know if somehow it got written down wrong. I don't know if your order got switched with somebody else's. I just feel like the more we take on and pay attention to, sure, it's a little bit more work for us, but at the end of the day, what we're going for is a really premium, amazing experience for our customers start to finish. So it's really amazing pastured pork, but then we're every year trying to improve and then think about like, how can we uh, make the entire experience better for our customers? Because yeah, a lot of, they're, they're our family and friends and we care about them and yeah, we want it to be better for them. Um, yep, so there's a shot of me and my husband and our apprentice from last year, Matt. Um, so yeah, those veggie boxes are sort of goofy, but the nice thing about waxed vegetable bushel and a ninth boxes is that there, if there is any condensation, the boxes don't just melt. And we like those reusable tote bags um, to pack into instead of a cardboard box because it's like each of those tote bags is less than $2. And that's last time I checked cardboard is super expensive. So the when we decided to go that route, the bag was actually cheaper than the cardboard box. And then the foil liner, foil insulation liner that goes inside the box is reusable. And then obviously the um, the waxed cartons, the wax bushel and a ninth boxes do wear out over time or get um, grimy over time. Um, this insulated trailer does have a, a refrigeration unit on it. Um, we only deliver or transfer pork in the fall. And so usually we don't need it, but um, especially if it's a slightly warmer day, and we're bringing the halves and holes back to our farm um, for people to pick up. Then sometimes if, you know, usually the pork is only in the trailer for a pretty short amount of time, but just to be cautious, we'll run the AC unit and then not open the door. And especially with that foil liner, it's rock, it's rock solid by the time um, people pick it up. So that, that works really well for us. And then a super important process or part of the process, in my opinion, is soliciting feedback. Um, if you're like me and you live in the Midwest, the, there's totally a, a, a thing called Minnesota nice where people are just really hesitant to hurt your feelings or give you honest feedback. And so we like to ask people how their pork was. And then also we give them a chance to give us anonymous feedback. And then we also give them a chance to put their name on it if they want us to follow up with them. And this has been totally valuable. Um, we've learned all sorts of things that, especially with the anonymous um, feedback uh, form that, you know, sometimes just people don't feel comfortable saying like, man, I'm really bummed that the hot Italian sausage was, it was too hot and it was too salty or um, the bacon was a little too sweet for my taste or just all sorts of things. So I would highly recommend that everybody incorporate this. You can do this for free on Google Forms. Um, and I, I'm sure it helps with customer retention because people wanna, um, wanna be heard. And we do this on Jot Forms because we're already paying for it for the um, reservation cut sheet. Um, pricing. So <laughs> highlighted in yellow, underlined, do not undercut your neighbors with similar practices. And I always say this, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but the more off-farm income you have, the higher your prices need to be, not the other way around. Um, so for people, and, and, and also the more off-farm income you have, which is super common for a lot of us farmers, that's, that's the way most people make it in farming these days, um, using sales is a lever that you can pull, but just be be thoughtful about how you're um, putting that into practice because you don't want to just be training people to wait for sales and also in doing big freezer clean out sales you can be undercutting uh your neighbors and also if you have off farm income you have less risk and so you had you had better be accounting for your time and um just the the full picture and yeah we also our, our pork is, we, we sell our pork for $6.50 a pound hanging weight for holes, plus processing, plus delivery, or $7.50 a pound hanging weight, um, plus processing, plus delivery. And um, that's because I want to be, I want to be paid for my time. I want to be able to pay my employees well. Um, and I want to have the best pastured pork possible. And I feel like that deserves um, a price that 
appropriately it compensates me for all the extra stuff that we do. So please, please, please research what the other farms in your area. So they're not your competitors. Um, they're your peers. And there's, there's enough space for all of us here in the passion pork world. And I want to see a lot more um, cooperation and collaboration. So research what your peers who are using similar methods are charging. And then I would say sort of the scale um, from best to, you know, more run of the mill is, so I call them like actually pastured pigs. I think there are a lot of folks out there who do pastured, um, which means that they're sort of like in one big field and the pasture isn't intentionally managed and there's a lot of mud um, and it's more of a monocrop of, or a monoculture of pasture species. Um, sometimes there's some animal welfare issues like yeah, that's a whole other presentation about the difference between like actually pastured and then pastured. And then there's dry lot pigs on small farms. And then there's confinement pigs, either concrete or uh, deep bedded. So just figure out what do you want to do or what are you doing and talk to your peers about what their, what their prices are and then maybe why their prices are the way they are. Also consider um, obviously what feed are you feeding? Cause that's going to be a massive part of your costs. Um, we, we do organic corn and soy and fish meal free feed. So it's an organic pea and barley feed. Um, you might do organic, um, corn and soy, you might do non-GMO, you might do conventional. Um, you just have to, that that's going to affect your price quite a bit and then breed too. Some of these slow growing breeds are going to take two years to finish out or, um, between a year and two years. And yeah, you should probably um, make sure that you're compensating yourself for that whole, you know, extra year to year and a half that you're keeping the pig on your farm. Um, so what we, what I advise is that uh, if you want somewhere to start, do a sort of a back of the envelope calculation of what are you spending per pig on feed? And I, we actually feed our pigs about 850 pounds of feed plus pasture, plus all that um, other uh, gleaned vegetable and fruit matter. Um, but just to be conservative, say a thousand pounds per pig to finish them out. And then multiply that times three, and that should be your absolute bare minimum for what you're charging, not including processing. So that that is just a, a very rough way to start thinking about how much you should be um, charging for your pork. Yeah, so that's what I've got for you guys. Um, questions, comments, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, FACT. And I, yeah, I'm hoping that people found some good nuggets in here for things to try on your farm um, and happy to answer questions. Wow, yeah, that was amazing. I was jotting down notes the whole time. I love oh, it. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, I'm going to unshare your screen. Go ahead and share mine. Okay, unshare, let's see, oops, there we go. All right, that was an absolutely wonderful presentation. We still have time to take questions and we might go a little bit over okay. um, one o'clock Eastern time. So um, certainly if you have a hard stop at one, um, don't we, we won't be offended if you leave because <laughs> we are going to probably go a little bit over um the other thing um i just wanted to say is uh that um you know you can always watch the recording because you will get the recording and so with that um okay there's lots of nice things going on in the chat there. Okay. Um, I am going to go ahead and run my poll so that you get your thoughts together, Dana, and maybe, um, maybe drink water. <laughs> it's just a red face, too. So much talking. <laughs> so much talking. All right. So if you wouldn't mind ans answering our end of webinar evaluation, that's really helpful to us. Um, you know, we we're in a space where we have to get funding. So this is always good for our reporting and stuff like that. So, all right. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and look at some of the Q&A. You ready, Dana? I am ready. All right. We'll just stop at, start at the top. Um, so how old are your hogs when you sell them in the fall? April would like to know. So April, our, we don't really go by age as much as we do weight. We shoot for a 280 to 
320 pound live weight and we have a scale on the farm. And so we weigh all of our pigs every other week or every third week. And so we're just sending them off when they hit the right um, weight. But roughly speaking, our pigs are born in March and April, and then they are ready to butcher in October and November. All right. Um, oops, put me down at the bottom again. How do you get people excited? Claudia would like to know this. How do you get people excited about things uh, like bones, lard, jowl, et cetera? I think, well, first with jowl, just turn it into bacon and people get, as once they try bake, jowl bacon, they get obsessed with it. Yeah, um, they do. <laughs> and then bones and lard and other things. I think it's sharing recipes. I think it's you yourself being really stoked about it and sharing that via Instagram or Facebook or um, put out a couple recipes. Um, if it's something that you really can't stand using, then find a customer who's like absolutely in love with um, bone broth. Like, I don't know who doesn't like bone broth, but you know what I mean? Um, I do that a lot. Like uh, we, so we invite customers for our own sake to um, just uh, to text us all the time with like pictures of the feasts that they've made. And so oftentimes if I see, oh my gosh, this person has an amazing recipe or uh, like, I don't, I don't do gluten. And so a lot of times people are really stoked about using the lard in their baking. And so I just invite them to share, share it with me. And then I usually post it on Instagram. So yeah. Um, get stoked about it yourself or find people who are stoked about it and sh share that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Brooke asks, um, can Jot Forms and or Google Forms save cut sheets for repeat customers? Yep. Right. That's an easy answer. <laughs> um, how do you identify your hogs per customer? Ed would like to know. Um, I think I might need clarification. Like, are you, Ed, are you asking like if someone is really involved and they want to know, like I had, I want to see a picture of the pig that I'm eating. Is that what, is that what you want to know, Ed? If, if that's the case, I, each pig has an ear tag. And so I know, I know who everybody is throughout the season. That's how we track weights. And I also know which pig has what hanging weights and then what hanging weights went to which customers. So if somebody wanted to know, ah, yes, ear tags. And you could do that with ear notching too, if you understand how to read ear notches, which I don't. And I like ear tags. Yeah, highly recommend ear tags. It's so fun to um, collect that data. Um, I'm a dork about data, so. So Brooke wanted to know if you could provide a template cut sheet for a hog. Um, I think a lot of that is gonna be specific to your butcher, the butcher that you're working with. Yep. That's my ex exact answer. I would just talk to your processor and try to work. So they'll, chances are they already have some sort of cut sheet mm -hmm. um, and try to work off of that. So it's as easy as possible for them and do little things. Like when you bring in your own cut sheet, like I should have done this so much earlier, of like make sure the font is big enough, make sure it's like in the right order, just, just solicit feedback. Oftentimes like the processors I've worked with will bend over backwards for their farmers and so oftentimes they're not willing to just voluntarily be like, hey, could you actually reorder this? So just constantly ask them, like, is there anything I can do to make your life easier? And our, proce our processor lets us know exactly what we need to do to make okay, their life easier. Okay, so maybe this is the Minnesota they are thing. Very, I don't, yeah, North Carolina, we're supposed to be super nice, but our processor isn't. But, yeah. um, and actually our processor is Piedmont Custom Meats in North Carolina, and they have an online cut sheet. So if you wanted to get an idea, um, you can actually just go to their website and just download their cut sheet. And that's, yeah, that's what they that's use. That's a great that's reminder. If you have a processor who's just super modern and they already have all this stuff, you can just use theirs. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, we were, we've just worked with, with processors who are honestly so freaking busy. They have not had a second to even sit down and breathe and think about like, how would we change our cut sheet if we had time or how would we do this differently um so that's we just took it upon ourselves to to do it right yeah our processors cut sheet is pretty pretty good it's, it's, it's long it's really long okay. <laughs> but anyway so piedmont custom meats um just look it up all right so what do you do if um mark wants to know what do you do if a customer misses their pickup um we haven't had that happen um if we do 
have it happen. Well, um, when we're renting freezer space, we would probably just put it back in the freezer space um, and just text them. I mean, basically I, I give them a window and say, okay, on this date from nine to 11, I need you to come pick up your pig. Um, so I let them know a month out. I let them know a week out. I let them know the day before. And then if I don't see them by 1030, I shoot them another quick text. Um, just so, that, And that's probably why we haven't had a lot of folks who forget. I've had people be late and it's like stuff happens, you know, just right. try to build in extra time. Um, but yeah, if you don't have a freezer space, that's rough. Maybe just let your customers know, like, look, I'm trying to be flexible, but if you don't pick up your pork, like I don't really have a backup and I want you to get your pork frozen, really frozen and super high quality. And so just please do everything you can. Um, I think also one way you could do it if you also do deliveries and just say like, if you miss your pickup window, unfortunately I will have to deliver the pork that day and it will be $75. Or yeah, both. that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Claudia wants to know, how did you find freezer space to lease? And that's what, for us, we used to have a spot in Durham. I'm in North Carolina and, um, they closed their doors and so <laughs> we don't have a space. And so that's why we had to get a walk-in put on our, our farm, but yeah, it's a challenge. It's rough. Um, we got lucky and we just found an inn with a place, but yeah, it's, there aren't that many of them. That's tough. And one thing that we've done before, uh, we usually do this with our turkeys, um, just because our freezer is full of all of our other meats. And then when we go to process turkeys, uh, we've got, because we do like 400 turkeys. So we do, that's, that's a lot to fit in a freezer because they're big. And we've rented those, um, we rent from Triangle Ice, because we're in the Triangle of North Carolina. So it's actually an ice trailer. And um, they'll let you rent it for, I think we rented it for two months. I mean, it wasn't cheap, but we built yeah. that into our pricing with because cool. we, we knew we were going to have to do it. So that's another way to do it. You may be able to just get one. Um, uh, you'd have to be careful about the the plug that we had. We we had a, um, a the special kind of like the 220 plug that they needed, but you can get uh, them where they just do a regular, you know, 120 plug in. Nice. So. So Vince would like to know for the US for the USDA, how do you demonstrate that a given animal is matched to a given customer? I think you've already answered this because you've got the tags. Yep. Um, I will say, Vince, we are lucky in that since our processor is USDA certified. So if I wanted to, I could just sell all the cuts that we get back from our pigs. But to um, specifically answer your question, yes, they keep one pig ends up in one set of trays. And each each cut is labeled with um, the customer's name on it too. So oh, yeah. yeah, it's all it's all pretty clear. They, I mean, they've been doing freezer freezer pork and whole and a half animals forever, so they've got it real dot real dialed in. Okay, Laura would like to know: Do you break out processing fees in, on the invoice, and do you mark up all mark up at all to account for credit card processing fees? I was under the impression that you can't charge people extra to use a credit card. Um, so we certainly don't do that. Um, and no, we just, any credit card fees, it just, it all gets sort of wrapped into the general pricing, but most people don't pay with a credit card. We get, we receive payment in a way that we don't have to pay credit card fees because, you know, a credit card fee on a $1,200 to $1,400 sale is pretty rough. Yeah. Checks right. are fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what, when you're pricing your, when you're pricing your meat, that's one of the things you're going to have to take into consideration. Yeah. So Leaf um, asks, I may have missed it, but did you say that you slaughter all your hogs at the same time? If so, what about spring versus fall new litters? So we don't farrow. Um, and we only have, uh, we only finish in the fall, uh, fall. So we only pick up pigs in the we only get feeder pigs that, sorry I'm a little distracted because my dog just came in the room and he's so <laughs> cute he's so distracting um okay let me start over we only finish once a year so we get feeder pigs in the spring we um keep them until the fall once our first slaughter date comes in first week of October we take the 14 10 to 14 biggest hogs and repeat each week until they're all gone um, and so, no, we don't do any overwintering of livestock or winter winter finishing or just farrowing in general. 
this is actually what I we've been farrowing for years, and I think we're gonna we're talking about moving more to your model. Um, I'm still gonna do farmers markets because I have other cuts, um, but still, um, I really like the idea of doing the hogs that way and just having some extras. Um, yeah. Anyway, so Nick asks, are you processing? Uh, well, you've already said you're under USDA, um, and his question is, if custom exempt, then how are you handling the payment to the process? Okay, so if yeah, I think that's. Yeah, just talk about if you could just talk about yeah, if you're doing custom and that's going to be different depending on where you are, but custom versus if you've got there's also Talmadge Aiken plants and then there's also cooperative interstate plants and then there's also your state regular state plants and then there's the USDA plants. Yeah, so, well, Nick, I would answer your question by saying if custom exempt, um, then you just have the customer and pay for the process, pay for the processing directly over the phone with a credit card. Or you have them pick up and pay for the processing there. And, I, and some, uh, yeah. somebody put a pretty detailed um, response to that in the chat. So Nick, if you want to read that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. And again, we're processing at a processor for who is USDA, but we could pretty easily just translate our whole system over to somebody who's custom exempt. So Janice actually, and I'll answer this, um, uh, she wanted you to show the formula for pig pricing again. Janice, if you just uh, click on the link for the slides, which I can share again, um, or uh, Larissa will be sending that out tomorrow as well, you can just go ahead and um, and uh, get that get to that slide so you can do that on your own. Mm -hmm. And I would say don't, it's not a formula. It's sort of just a back of the envelope. Like I know <laughs> when people are getting into farming, they're always talking about like, no, all of your cost of production and all that. It's like, well, that's really hard when you're a beginning farmer. So just use that as sort of like a, a guide, just a little bit of guidance. Yeah, and um, the I, I shared earlier on Meat Suite from Cornell. They actually help you go through all of that. And that's for pricing for retail cuts and for bulk cuts as cool. well. Um, so, uh, Sarah would like to know how, how did you find customers when you first started? Uh, good old fashioned networking. So talking to family and friends and then asking them to leave us a Google review and to share information with their friends, going to events, um, where food minded, sustainability minded people were gathering. Um, yeah, nothing paid advertisements have never worked out for us. So it's just have a good website, have a good social media presence, have a good newsletter, show up and talk to people. Yeah, and I think it also people are always afraid to start with a newsletter before they've actually got a product, but there's no harm in starting, uh, you know, an Instagram page or starting a newsletter or any of those sorts of things while you're getting yourself up and running because people like the process as well. They like to sort of feel like they're part of your journey. And so yeah, and I think I'm not really quite sure Aaron's asking, um, how do you help encourage customers to get back more from their pig barn, bones, lard, trotters, et cetera? Will a standard cut sheet work? So our, our process, of the, it's on the cut sheet. I think most processes probably have it on the cut sheet that you can choose to get those things. But what, how are you? Um, so in our situation, customers have the choice to not. Oh, wait, where did the question just go? Oh, I just, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was going to look. I put it under, I, I put it under okay. answer. I'm sorry. I can't, okay. I don't think I heard it back. Okay. Um, we, they don't have to get all of their stuff back, like bones and lard and all of that. And uh, if they don't want it, some of it, we just keep, like if they don't want their hearts, we'll just keep them and feed them to the dog. Um, but if, uh, yeah, I, I think just customer education about recipes and how to use it, um, sort of what we were talking about before applies to that too. But just so, letting them know, like, you are paying for all of this stuff. This is right. included in your hanging weight. So absolutely, please get all, all you can. Yeah, and you might even want to, um, to and you sounds like you give them a lot of stuff. So you, so you give them recipes and stuff like that, or you just do that on your Instagram. Do you actually hand that to them? Um, this year, we, we like to include a little gift with every um, delivery or every pickup. So every, every time somebody orders from us and they come and get it from us, we like this past year, we gave them a little bottle of five spice and a recipe for egg roll in a bowl and a sticker in a little baggie oh, and that went in with their pork. Year, in years past, we've get, given them a bar or two of lard soap made from our lard um, or a packet of custom pig art that uh, a customer of ours painted. And so just a nice little thank you note. So yeah, this year we did include a recipe, 
with a spice and people went nuts for that. And so we're going to do a lot more of that. Yeah. Cause that would be one way you could, you could give some recipes with the mm -hmm. bones. Yeah. Very cool. Dana, you're the best. I just, Oh, love you're the best. <laughs> So Laura would like to know, Laura's had some good questions. Are you using Substack, Substack as your main email service provider instead of uh, MailChimp? And um, do you find better open conversion rates with Substack over MailChimp? We are using Substack as our main email service provider. MailChimp and Wix and all those other ones have just way too many bells and whistles that I'm never going to use. Like we like to write a text and then put a picture in and write a text and include some links. Like that's it. It's nice, a nice clean uh, interface that I really like. And um, the cool thing about Substack is that it gives you the option to include. Um, so I'm sure you have people from across the country who just want to follow you on your farm, um, but can't actually buy your stuff. They might um, they they might actually subscribe to your farm. And so actually they could like we're finding the people who buy from us and people who don't buy from us are pledging subscriptions. So they just like, like what we're doing. They love that we focus on pollinator and wildlife habitat. They love that we're helping incubate new farmers. And like somebody just pledged like $150 a year just to read my newsletter. And wow. yeah, it's amazing. It's really generous. And I don't think any of the other platforms have that um, feature so cleanly built in. Oh, wow. I think I might be moving to Substack now. <laughs> I love I've it. MailChimp for like the last 15 years or 20 years, something crazy. <laughs> I, I didn't really get Substack until like the first three people subscribed or um, um, pledged support. And then I was like, oh my gosh, maybe there's something to this. So now, yeah, any pledges we get, we're just going to spend on um, pollinator habitat on our farm. Kind Wonderful. of thing. I love it. I'm definitely yeah. on Substack now. Okay. Uh, Rhonda would like to know, what do you pay for your feeders and what age do you get them? And then she also wanted to know if you're doing it under contract with anybody. And can you leave the questions up? I can. Forever? Yeah, or just till you've no, answered? No, just, just as I'm, just when there's multiple. <laughs> Sorry. To, to a question. That's okay. Um, Sorry. Yes, the, the, the purchases are, we, we do purchase feeders um, with a contract. Um, what do we pay for feeders about 125 to 135 bucks a piece. And we ask for them to be at least 60 to 80 pounds. Um, so they're born in March and April and then usually come to us in June. So we don't really ever go off of age. It's weight. Um, and yes, I would always recommend a written contract with anybody that you're buying feeder pigs with, even if it's just 10 pigs. Yeah, I think it's important to know because this happened in 2020 in North Carolina where a bunch of um, uh, the guys, they were, um, the, you know, the confinement guys, the CAFO guys, they were getting rid of all their piglets because they, you know, they were having issues getting them processed. So they were, you could get a, a third, you know, one month old piglet for like 25 bucks. And I would not touch those piglets with a 10 foot old. They are never going to be um, as hardy as you need them to be. And yeah. so uh, when you're going to get piglets, make sure you're getting them from somebody who grows the way that you grow um, or, the, the, or in a similar climate to what you're going to be putting them out in. So those confinement pigs, just they're not hardy enough and they're too young. A month is way too young. So yeah. I know and people had devastating just, results. Yeah, I'd also say just make sure you have a good communication because inevitably the pigs are going to show up with some sort of problem and you, you're going to want to know that you can have an open dialogue with the person who you're buying the pigs from. That's a good point too. And oh my God, Emily, I love this question. How do you coordinate your fresh pork with your smoked product? Because for us, it can be six weeks and diff the difference is six weeks. Well, that's the great thing with whole and half hogs is that you don't have to coordinate. It's all frozen and it's all like you pick up um, the whole half hog or the whole whole hog when it's done the whole thing is done so there's a oh lot so they less. don't make you pick up your cuts and then come back and get your smoke product nope wow I like yeah that. it's great um yeah I really appreciate that part and um if so we do have a couple of customers who are very advanced and they want to process their half or whole at home um and they they're the the very, very in the very small minority of folks who do just um, coordinate with the processor. So they want to pick up the whole pig um, fresh, so not frozen. And so they they do just 
pick up directly from the processor. Um, so, and you don't, I guess the processing fees are just different. So that's still, you would charge them the same price. And that sort of leads into Aaron's question, which um, you had a 650, you mentioned a 650 and a 750 price. Um, what and, is that's the for, and that's hanging weight. So, so it's that plus processing plus a delivery fee. So the 650 would be for a whole hog and the 750 is for a half hog. Yep. And we'll do a lower price if somebody wants three or more hogs, but that's pretty rare. That's a lot of pork. <laughs> a lot of pork. And so recommendations for finding it. This is our very last question and we're going to finish. And we went 17. I really appreciate all of you guys who've hung in there with us. Uh, there's still 91 of you. So <laughs> they wanted to hear what you had to say, Dana. Good. That's great. Um, I hope so this has been helpful. I think so. Um, recommendations on finding a good processor and what makes a good processor. Well, lucky you if you have more than one processor to choose from. Um, <laughs> I would say sometimes it's just you have to work with who you've got. Um, for me, if you do have multiple options, it's how far out are they booking? Um, we book our slaughter dates a year in advance. Um, we are, are, can you communicate with them? Can you text, text with them? Can you call them? Um, do you like the way that they uh, cure and smoke bacon and hams? Um, a lot of that will just be personal preference. Um, yeah, so just ask, I'd say that your first stop should just be asking other farmers in the area, who do you like and why? And go from there. That's a good idea. Okay, so I have a few housekeeping items to share before we sign off today. A recording of this webinar and the slides will be available soon. These documents will be archived on our website and Larissa will also email them to you in, within a few days. Usually she's really good about doing it within the first 24 hours. We also have some other good webinars coming up. Over the next few months, Larissa will send links to all of our upcoming webinars and other opportunities for farmers and ranchers in her follow-up email as well. A sincere thank you to Dana. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my colleague Larissa for everything she does to prepare for and follow up with our webinars. She's amazing. And finally, if you, if you, we would like to thank everyone out there. You guys are always amazing. You always come up with really great questions. Just a, just a absolutely wonderful group of people. So thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to um, end the webinar and um, hopefully everybody will have an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Larissa. And thank you, Fact. Thank you, Dana. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.